A lot of head fakes. So let's talk about the three things that we are watching right now that you need to know about as we are seeing strategists sort of synthesize all of this action you've been talking about. We've been seeing revised analyst forecasts and new notes showing that even some of the market bulls are getting more nervous or more cautious about the current state of U.S. stocks. There's a new note from Morgan Stanley strategist Mike Wilson. Surprise. He's still bearish. He says the S&P 500 is likely going to trade as low as 3,400 by mid to late August. That's lower even than his 3,900 12-month target for the index. And while Wilson, of course, is an established market bear, uh, more bullish RBC Capital Markets equity analyst Lori Calvacina also today out in a note trimming her year-end forecast. Now she's going to 4,700 from 4,860. So we see a new average of the consensus forecast there on your screen about 4701 and you know obviously a lot of this comes down to the fed and whether they're going to be able to engineer a hard landing or not jan hatzius of goldman sachs this morning says he thinks a soft landing is possible even though it's a narrow path to get there what's interesting to me you guys calvacina saying she doesn't think a recession is going to happen and i was just looking at you know, what does 4,700 imply? Well, we closed on December 31st, 2021 at 4,766. So we're not looking at a collapse according to that forecast or according to the average forecast, but we're looking at a, a sort of a lost year, right? One where you didn't, you're not going to see necessarily much change. No, and, and Julia, it, it's interesting to read Lori's note and you have Mike Wilson. The one theme that I would argue Ties, ties them all together is this view that earnings estimates on Wall Street have not come down, not just a little, at all. I mean, you have a lot of analysts on Wall Street simply ignoring what Microsoft said last week about FX volatility. You have them ignoring inflation pressures. You have them ignoring continued supply chain bottlenecks and leaving these estimates as if, uh, leaving them at levels as if things were growing, things were fine, and things were improving, and you're not getting that sense yet. Well, there is compression across the board right now, and I think we have to recognize that. And the margins for a lot of these companies, when they do have to come out with some of these revisions, updating their guidance, and more often than not, it has been to the downside recently. And with that in mind, Microsoft last week, but then additionally, even what we've heard from companies like Lululemon, even over the course of their extended strategy, a lot of these companies putting out extended strategies just also goes to note that there is some of that bearish sentiment that is certainly at play right now. And they're trying to reposition people's attention, investors' attention towards the three-year, towards the five-year out target for them. And that's the growth story that they want to tell. And so all of these things considered, I think when we look at the consumer right now, and what they're navigating through, that's where it starts to show up in the actual data. When you look across the different job openings that are still out there and also looking at where those are starting to get filled, where they will start to get filled, that's a larger question, too, is if some of those jobs kind of get pulled back off the table, you know, what ultimately does that leave out there for some of the wage growth, some of the companies that we've continued to talk about on a daily basis and, and how they're going to navigate and still be productive throughout this era as well? Yeah, good questions. And that, that's the problem right now. I guess we still have more questions than we do answers. Uh, I've got to talk about thing number two, which is an unplanned thing number two. And that's because we have a breaking uh, filing from Elon Musk regarding Twitter, in which effectively he is threatening to call off his acquisition. Why? Well, he says in a letter and in this 13D filing to Twitter that he's been asking for this information regarding their methodology as to how they calculate how many uh, bots and how much spam is on Twitter, and he says the company has not been responsive. So as a result, he says, Mr. Musk believes the company is actively resisting and thwarting his information rights and the company's corresponding obligations under the merger agreement. He says, this is a clear material breach of Twitter's obligations under the merger agreement, and Mr. Musk reserves all rights resulting therefrom, including his right not to consummate the transaction and his right to terminate the merger agreement. Now, this doesn't seem to say he is doing that, but that he could. So, you know, we kind of knew perhaps this was a possibility, right? But this is the first time in legal terms um, that his representation has spelled that out, you guys. The reaction Twitter shares, as you saw, is downward on the possibility that this might not be happening. Well, you, I think, Julie, you see here Elon Musk continuing to play hardball with the board uh, and 
uh, with the likes of the management team over at Twitter here, as he should. I mean, this spam thing is a very problem. And I know it, get, it got disclosed to a certain degree in the company's annual report, but still it's on Twitter to come out here and define more specifically how many accounts, how many bots or how many fake accounts are on this platform. And by and large, they have not done this. So as somebody pointing up potentially billions of dollars of its own money uh, to buy an asset like this, good for him for pushing to get these disclosures. You know, as we're continuing to watch shares of Twitter move lower here in pre-market, it's also in tandem with the move that we continue to see in Tesla shares, as we know that the financing of this would likely be directly um, involving some of his own Tesla stock, and those shares are moving higher pre-market by about 3.6%. But, you know, all of these things considered, with regard to him wanting to or getting the necessary details in order for him to make what could be lower than a $44 billion acquisition at this point. Now that we're looking at this potentially getting back into Twitter's court, what, what does Twitter put out there? What do they say in pushback? Well, real quickly, Julie, uh, look, the, I've talked to a couple people inside, uh, inside Twitter recently, and they still think this deal is going to get done. But I think for it to get done, ultimately, they're going to have to give up some more information. Um. You know, I'm on the other side of you from this. And I think Matt Levine, columnist for Bloomberg, put it best when he said Musk is lying when he says he's so concerned about the bots. This is a negotiating tactic when you say, oh, he's playing hardball with the board. They owe him this blah, blah, blah. I think that that is a load of what are you, you use these these euphemisms frequent, frequently steaming pile of garbage mm-hmm. or one of your other euphemisms. Well, I don't think he's lying at all. I don't think he's lying I, at all. You know, I, I think, he, I think if he's going to spend excuse. billions of dollars for this asset, he should excuse. get disclosures. It's an ex- he should have gotten disclosures when he was doing due diligence before he made the offer to buy the company. This is a red herring now. He's upset that the stock has fallen so much, that the market has fallen so much, and that he's paying more than he thinks that the company's worth. That was on him. He made the, he made the offer. He made the agreement to buy the company. And he should abide by that agreement. He should have done his due diligence before he made that agreement, if, in fact, this is really the reason. Well, there's only so much due diligence he can do. I mean, as part, when you get a deal, uh, when you put a deal forth like this, you are entitled to get some form of information that is not necessarily beforehand. public. Beforehand. Beforehand. You can do that beforehand. That's what most, uh, that's what most uh, acquirers do before they make the agreement to buy a company. They don't say, you know, I mean... Come on, this is more of the same. He's just trying to get a lower price. And it, it's a negotiating. Price. And it's not like he went about this the correct way. It's not about. It's not like he went out to Twitter and went through all of the filings, the necessary kind of due diligence. To your point, Julie, as well, ahead of time, and then additionally went through the necessary legal steps in order to actually present an offer. He he did the exact thing that we would have expected somebody in an activist position to do. He acquired a massive amount of stake, uh, a 9% stake, and then went out and said, hey, I, I am the largest stakeholder in Twitter right now, single shareholder in Twitter. And now going forward from here, yeah, it's a passive stake. He lied about that. He also, later on, one and I, I think at the end of the day, it's just mind boggling to think about how much he has actually just inflated so much of the thought around what he could do to Twitter and that he could bring it back, when in reality, I don't think there is anything that can be done to Twitter to eliminate the bots, to monetize it beyond what they've done. Perhaps there's more monetization that could be done, but what is he going to do to actually make that happen? It's Elon Musk. He's sending rockets into the world. You would have to believe that he can figure something along these lines. This guy helped co-found PayPal. All right, well, I like these hot takes, but I am saying, I am getting my ear, we have to switch gears. <laughs> Another big bank raising flags is Citigroup. The bank releasing a long new note saying shortages of semiconductors, car parts, and other items that flow through supply chains will persist. City's global chief economist of research, Nathan Sheets, writes that the Russia-Ukraine conflict has shattered any hopes of near-term improvement. Can't say that I'm surprised. I have a more on this uh, really extensive note now on the Yahoo Finance homepage, but still... You know, Julie, I was talking to a lot of folks uh, at the World Economic Forum now about a week and a half ago, and most notably Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. He was looking for supply chain improvement just for semiconductors in 2023. He pushed that out into 2024. So a major red flag. 
Yeah, I mean, and and basically, if you boil it down, what this note seems to say is we thought things would be getting better by now, right? I mean, isn't that the kind of the, the bottom line here and that the inventory issues are not necessarily getting better? I mean, everywhere you look around the globe, you still are seeing issues from Ukraine still having problems um, exporting grain, for example, to you know that part of the food supply chain to the tech part of the supply chain that you're talking about with semiconductors. So, you know, as much as we talk about the Fed raising rates in order to tighten financial conditions and press on that lever of uh, inflation, it's not going to get better until the supply chain issues get better. Oh, yeah, this happens while we also have some port situations that are extremely congested right now and still trying to work through those backlogs as well. Uh, we do have to get to Apple here, though, on the morning as well. Apple kicking off its Worldwide Developers Conference today. Software is going to be in focus as the company is expected to debut its long-rumored reality OS for VR and AR headsets. We're also expecting to get a new look at updates to the OS for existing products here. Now, the, the huge thing about this developer conference, just to kind of put it in context for everybody and, and our viewers especially, I mean, it's become even more important over the last three years. It's this kind of juxtaposition between the contentious App Store fees um, and that relationship with developers. And then on the other side of that, you've got the services revenue run rate that has the potential to be an $80 billion business that after reaching a $50 billion annual business just two years ago at this point. Only thing I want about from Apple here, I, I appreciate they continue to hold these events as if it was 10 years ago and they're coming out with some new whiz-bang iPhone that will change all of our lives. Um, but look, I, the only thing I want to know from Apple is when are supply chains going to improve uh, and they can get these products c to consumers a lot quicker than they have been. I don't think you'll hear that at this event, but still, you have to watch it nonetheless.